Thank you, Sister Sweetheart, Lady Laverne, my lovely wife, for the announcements and for that beautiful prayer. And now we turn our attention to our celebration. First of all, though, on behalf of all the men of Valley Brook, we want to thank you ladies, marvelous ladies of Valley Brook, for such a heartwarming, heartfelt, deeply touching tribute on Father's Day. I think it would have been almost impossible to watch that without being moved in some way and to and, and move towards a greater appreciation for God's grace towards us to be men and to be fathers. You made us feel loved and we thank you for that. This is Strategic Faith Launch Sunday and Communion Sunday. So we don't have a title for our message. If you're looking for a title, it's Strategic Faith Launch Commemoration 2019, or 2020, I should say, not 2019, 2020. Um, the verse that I'd like for you to turn to in your Bibles is Psalm 105. And how appropriate that the, uh, the uh, reading, the scripture reading during our offertory uh, was Psalm 100 which speaks about just praising the Lord with everything, with timbrels and dancing, stringed instruments and pipes, with trumpet sounds, with resounding trumpets, and then let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That's what we're going to be doing this morning together. So Psalm 105, verses 1 through 5. If you're looking for a text verse, although technically speaking, this isn't a text verse, I will be referencing a phrase from this quite often. So I guess as far as the closest thing to a text verse in a normal sermon, this would be it. Psalm 105 verses 1 through 5. Oh, give thanks. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. So this translation will be a little bit different than those of you who are using the New International Version. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Verse 5, remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. We're here this morning to remember the Lord's wonders. We're here to let our hearts be glad this morning. We're here to reflect upon and to speak of all his wonderful acts, the marvelous things that he has done for us because he has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. It says, glory in his holy name. I like this phrase and it stood out to me this morning as I was meditating on it. What does it mean to glory in his holy name? How do you feel when you get that brand new outfit that you've been wanting for a long time and you finally put it on and you see how you look in it and it feels good, you look good. How does that feel? How does it feel when you put on those new shoes and they not only good, look, look good, but they feel amazing? How do you feel when you're riding in that freshly washed car? You know how it is. Seems like when your car is clean, the engine runs better. How do you feel when you're sitting in that car that has been freshly washed? How do you feel when the family is gathered on a special event or spontaneously and everybody's in a good mood? The kids are playing well together and there's affection flowing and you sit back in that moment and you just, you glory, you, you, you develop, you envelop, you absorb, you appreciate, you enfold yourself in that moment. And this is what it means to glory in his holy name. One translation or one commentary says, make it a matter of joy that you have such a God as ours in your life. <laughs> That's what it means to glory in his holy name, his character, what he is like, his attributes, luxuriate, sit back, think about it, let the comfort of who he is, let the joy of who he is, let, let his power and wisdom and all the marvelous things about him envelop you 
and let your heart be glad. Make it a matter of joy. Let your heart be glad. We're here this morning, assembled virtually, to put those glorious words into practice, brothers and sisters. We're, we're here specifically to give thanks to God for uh, his faithfulness to our church family collectively and to each of us individually, as well as universally giving thanks to him for the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, which was shed for us so that we might have the kind of relationship with him in which we can glory in his holy name. It's appropriate that we end our series on the family, which is what June was about. It's appropriate that we end our series with this celebration because we have found that um, what we're focusing in on today, as I share this with you, what we're focusing in on today applies not just to our church family, but to our individual family challenges as well, and to our own individual personal challenges, as you'll see. And uh, in fact, what we're going to be looking at today is relevant for any challenge, literally any challenge we face. We're also here, as I said, to give thanks to the Lord through communion, uh, to the one who made himself known to us and has given us eternal favor. The one who has disclosed himself to us and made himself real to us. We call this fourth Sunday in June our strategic faith launch commemoration. And it started in 2014 when in response to a financial crisis that our church was going through, we were um, facing this situation, didn't know what to do, but we looked to the Lord and we sought him for three things. And one of those things was not money. Interestingly enough, we were in the midst of a financial crisis, but one of the things we were seeking the Lord for was not money. One of those three things. What were they? First, we asked him to use this crisis. Lord, use this, this pressure. Use this obstacle. Use our consternation about this. Use what could be potentially disruptive and divisive. Use this, Lord, to help us to get to know you better. Because Jeremiah 9 tells us that the thing to be desired more than anything else on this earth is to understand and to know him better. So, Lord, use this crisis to help us to know you better. Because you said that that's the greatest treasure that we can possess. So that was the first thing that we sought him for back in 2014. The second thing we sought him for was that he would use this crisis to help us to deepen in our love for one another. Instead of it pulling us apart, which money has the potential singularly more than anything else to pull people apart, we ask the Lord instead, Lord, use this crisis to make us closer to one another. Use this crisis to deepen our love for one another. Because when it comes to Christian discipleship, when it comes to Christian holiness, when it comes to Christian activity, when it comes to Christian mission, Jesus places our love for one another at the very top of the list. And so, Lord, use this crisis to deepen our love for one another. And the third thing we asked him for was we asked him to use that financial crisis to help each one of us individually to better understand how valuable we are to the work that he's doing on this earth. That um, he's doing not only at Valley Brook, but that he's doing in the world in general. That he chose us to work alongside of him. He designed us for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He has given us gifts. He has given us resources. He has given us personality. He has given us talents, each one of us unique, each one of us intended to be impactful for the kingdom of God. So Lord, use this crisis to make each one of us aware of how valuable we are to the work that you are doing and, and to make ourselves available to however you want to use us 
in our individual expression with our own individual gifts and talents and resources, how you would like to use us as part of the solution. Because the Lord meets the needs of the body with the body. And so Lord, whatever we need, the resources are within our church because you have created this body and it is it consists of members of your body and you meet the needs of the body with the body. So Lord, help us to grasp our significance in this moment of crisis, each one of us. Help us not look at somebody else and see what they're doing, but to seek you and ask you, Lord, how do you want to use the blessings that you have placed within me, the blessings that you have made me to be to this world? As each one, 1 Peter says, as each one has received a special gift, use it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So that was our third prayer. In other words, Lord, help us to see ourselves as significantly in this moment and in this situation as you see us. So those were the three things we, we prayed about. And we called it a strategic faith launch because that's what it truly was. It was strategic in that we were not just praying, but we were praying with a clear and targeted purpose. It was faith driven. It was a faith, faith driven because we weren't just going through the motions. We were sincerely trusting God for these things. In fact, I remember saying as we were going through this crisis, I remember saying to our congregation on more than one occasion, as often as you feel the angst about this situation, as long as it remains unresolved and as long as we're in this place of flux, as long as we don't know what to do, as often as anxiety comes calling, as often as you are tempted to fret, I want you to think, think about this. Whenever you're tempted to think, we need to do something. Whenever you're feeling that frantic, whenever you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling that angst. This is what I want you to do with it. The thing I want us all to do is pray. That's what I want you to do. When that anxiety comes calling from, from the, the, the throes of the crisis, I want you to pray those three things. Lord, help us to know you. Help us to love you or to love each other. And then help us to trust you to release our gifts, our resources, and our effects. So when that anxiety comes calling, don't just try not to be anxious. Instead, redirect it in this positive direction and pray for those things. And guess what? God did meet the financial need. Surprise, surprise. We weren't even praying about the finances. We were praying about these other three things. And God met the financial need. But he did so much more. He did so much more. More importantly, what he did is establish our culture, the culture of our church. He established, strengthened, fortified the culture of our church with those three things that we were praying about. You see, here's the thing, and he made those things pillars in our church. See, see here's the thing about miracles in the scripture. For the most part, and you can do your own research on this, for the most part, when you look at the miracles in the scripture, the miracle eventually led to yet another obstacle. There was glee and there was elation, but down the road came another obstacle. Moses delivered the Israelites from Egypt into the wilderness <laughs> where because of them having been delivered, they were in the wilderness and they met subsequent challenges. They complained that they had it better when they were back in Egypt because of some of those challenges. Elijah destroyed the prophets of Baal in a mighty calling upon God. And um, it was just divinely awesome the way that God came through with, response, with a response to Elijah's prayer. And there was a miracle that took place right before the eyes of of the, um, the idolaters there, and one that we continue to uh, reflect upon even today, uh, where fire from heaven came down and lapped up the water and the sacrifice, 
And it was just an amazing display of the awesome power of God. So, but that miracle was followed by the wrath of Queen Jezebel, which frightened Elijah so much that he ran away and ran for his life and wished that he was dead. So on the heels of the miracle came another challenge. David slayed Goliath, and there was a great victory in Israel. The Philistines were put to flight. But what happened is it, it raised the ire of King Saul, and he turned a jealous eye upon David. So on the heels of this great victory that David precipitated, or the Lord brought through David, there was another trial. Saul became David's enemy and pursued him for the rest of his life. So God delivered us from that crisis, but learning from the mis-example of Israel, <laughs> we continue to pray for those things. As even after the immediate crisis was, was over, we continue to pray for those things as a protective coating, as preparation for the next crisis, which we knew, true to scripture, would come along. And so we not only prayed for immediate deliverance, we continue to pray for God to bless us with those things. And if you have a bulletin, if you go to our website and you look at our virtual bulletin, you will see on the back page of every bulletin since that time, those three things are there. Those prayer prompts are on the back of our bulletin and we remember them and we pray about them going forward. Not just as crisis insurance, these things have caused us to be vibrant individually and collectively. What is better? What is better? What world is better than one in which we are all getting to know the Lord better personally? What world is better than one in which we are um, loving one another with the love of Christ and more deeply and passionately? And, and what world is better than one in which each one of us feels engaged and connected with purpose in accomplishing the work of God? And so God has blessed us as we continue to pray about that. He continues to help us to get to know him. In um, uh, Matthew chapter 4, after his first two attempts to tempt Jesus failed, the evil one pulled out all stops all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor he offered. And Jesus knew what those of us who are getting to know Jesus are discovering, that all the riches of the world are not worth the blessings of knowing him and being in sync with him as we serve him. In the men's group conversation that we had the other day, just on uh, uh, Saturday, uh, Jesus as the center of our joy, that we, we, we were talking about that, that um, uh, intimacy with God is not just for the women in the church, but that even as men, we can embrace his affection for us. And uh, I, uh, I just want every member of our church to be driven by a glad heart, a heart that that um, is glad for the opportunity to know him, that's not goaded by shame or bullied by fear. You see, as we continue to go, God is continuing to bless us with that prayer we prayed when we were in crisis, that we would get to know him better. And he's continuing to do that. And I thank him for that. That is in the DNA now of our church. It is in the bloodstream. It is what we are talking about all the time. It is what we share with one another. It is what we are demonstrating in our affections for one another. And I just want every member of our church to be driven by a glad heart, a heart that's glad for the opportunity to know him. Don't want us to be, to be um, goaded by shame or, or bullied by fear but to be driven by this desire to know him better because there's nothing else better on the planet than to know him. It says here in Psalm 65, 8, where morning dawns and evening fades, you, Lord, call forth songs of joy. 
where, e where morning dawns and evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. So I want us to be drawn by the gladdening sounds of the Lord's songs of joy. I want our hearts to say, what is that beautiful melody? And to follow it as the music gets louder, but still further ahead. So we're continually drawn forward, drawing us ever forward towards him. And he is doing that. So we celebrate that. Let your heart be glad that the Lord is letting you hear that music. Brothers and sisters, let your heart be glad that the Lord is letting you hear that music. The great hymn goes, morning by morning, new mercies I see. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And, but I, morning by morning, new mercies I see, but I'm increasingly aware of your moment by moment mercies, not just morning by morning, but as the Lord continues to help us to get to know him, as he continues to bless us with that, and that is what this strategic faith launch was all about. Lord, help us to know you better. The great hymn goes, as I said, morning by morning, great is thy faithfulness. But the Lord does that moment by moment as we continue to trust him. Let your heart be glad for all the ways the Lord is helping you to know him better, brothers and sisters, as we commemorate the strategic faith launch. Let your heart today be glad for all the ways the Lord is helping you to know him better. We were also trusting him to deepen our love for one another, to use that crisis. And we're also trusting him as we go forward to continue to do so. He continues to deepen our love for one another. Many people have noted how he has used our not being able to meet during this time, how the Lord has used our not being able to meet as, um, uh, as a family, as we would like to. He's using that to strengthen our family. I have noticed how people that we barely were able to hear from when we were all meeting together now are piping up like cheerful little holy birds and saying things and we're also oh, that's who you are hey nice to see you i'm so glad to meet you and boy when we get back together again and that is a win brothers and sisters it's not an if when the lord works this whole thing out because the lord's doing something i'm just parenthetically moving off uh, track here a little bit, but the Lord is doing something grand and glorious in this time of confusion. He is doing his work and all mouths have to be still. All shoulders are shrugging at this time, but God ain't shrugging. He knows exactly what he is doing. He is moving things into position for the greater fulfillment of his work on this earth. And so brothers and sisters, don't fret about what is going on. Instead, give thanks to God, glory in his holy name for what he is putting into place right now. You see, when the moving van moves into a brand new house, boxes are everywhere. But when those boxes start getting unpacked and you have a place to put them where you want them to put, you sit back and you say, home, yeah. The Lord is arranging things so that his purposes can be escalated in these times. So we say glory in your holy name, Lord. And so we thank him for the let, let your heart be glad for all the ways that the Lord is helping you to know him better. He continues to deepen our love for one another. He continues to deepen our love for one another. Many have noted, as I said, how he's, he's using our not being able to meet as a family to strengthen our family. You are not alone in this. What am I talking about? Whatever it is, I've been in some deep its. And some of you have sat with me in the its. The Lord continues to deepen. If you're kind of just taking notes, the first thing is he continues to help us to get to know him. The second thing is that he's continuing to deepen our love. And some of you have sat with me in the its. I've sat with you in the its. Nothing validates me more as a pastor than your love for each other. You know, and the Lord continues to do that. He continues to deepen our love for one another. So we celebrate that. No amount of praise for a sermon that I've delivered compares to the flow of love among you all. 
nothing compares to the sweet sound of joyful fellowship and unconditional love of God-centered affection. Nothing pleases me more. Uh, no amount of praise for any sermon um, can compete with that. That's the validation that I seek. The amens that I seek, the amens that I pray for are the expressions of love, the words of encouragement, and the good humor that passes among us, that makes us linger long after the Bible study on Thursday is done. And all of us are sitting there looking at one another after the final amen. And then finally we decide, well, you know, maybe we should click off because we're still relishing and basking in the love for one another. See, that to me is an amen. When someone calls up and says to me that they have experienced love in a way that they didn't even believe was possible, that's an amen for me. When Brother George is talking about how he appreciates the fellowship of the church and then gets choked up in mid-sentence, that's that is an amen to me. Because you see, Brother George is always running around perpetrating love, but he is feeling the love of the church. And you know, that to me is the, 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 that's the culture of our church. Everyone walking around talking about how much of the love they're feeling, but nobody's running around boasting about the love that they're given. Thank you, Jesus, for using that crisis back in 2014 to deepen our love and for continuing that work as we go on. So thank you, Lord. That, that's the validation that I seek. And you know why? Because I don't see anything in the scriptures that pleases the Lord more than our love for one another. Nothing pleases him more than to hear the sweet sound of joyful fellowship and playful laughter and tearful compassion taking place in his body. Nothing pleases the Lord more than that. And that's why 1 Peter 4, 8 reminds us, after Peter gives three chapters of instruction, he says in chapter 4, verse 8, above all, whatever church is, <laughs> whatever you think church is, whatever you think the church should be doing, however active you think the church should be in the world, that's not the it. Because the scripture tells us not only here, but in so many places in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. I remember years ago, unfortunately, being shamed away from desiring the love of the brethren within the church. I remember some pastor stood up one time and said, God wants us to do more than sit around in a holy huddle and love one another. He wants us to be out there active and changing the world. And I felt a little bit of shame about how close our fellowship was. You know, he's talking about, he called it the holy huddle. And there were articles written about the holy huddle. But that's not what I see in the scripture. I see God blesses the holy huddle. And he calls the world to, to, to marvel at the holy huddle. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 8 and other places in the scripture, it says, above all, you may be busy. You may be holy. You may be effective. You may be the world's greatest evangelist. You may know the Bible backwards and forwards. You may be, you may be the, 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 the superhero of Christians. But the scripture says, above all, love one another fervently from the heart. Biblically speaking, nothing pleases the Lord more. So when we were praying about that, Lord, use this crisis to help us to love each other more. You know good and well the Lord was smiling. He was beaming. He was sitting back and that those are my people. They'll, I love it. Bring it on. Let the blessings rain down. They get it. They get it. They're focusing on loving one another. They're getting rid of attitudes of jealousy and competition. They're getting rid of little envies and they're getting rid of, of, of little petty arguments. They are receiving my love fully and allowing it to flow out to one another. Amen. Hallelujah. So that was the second thing that we were trusting him for. And he continues to do that among us. And the third, well, let me just say this parenthetically. Uh, Bobby and Dina, we love you. 
there's an announcement that I want you all to pay attention to, as I mentioned in the introduction before my wife came on, there's an announcement that they're going to be making and uh, I will let them make the announcement. I just want to say this, no one has been a greater contributor to the love in our fellowship than Bobby and Dina Abercrombie. No one has contributed more love, more of the stuff that I've been talking about than those two. And they, as I said, have an important, an important announcement because, but because we're doing this virtually and because it's video and all of that, I won't have a chance to respond. So I am giving my response right now, which is on behalf of Valley Brook, we love you and you two, you two are the best. And the third thing, that we trusted the Lord for and that he continues to do is to work on revealing to each of us how valuable we are to him and how valuable we are to the eternal work that he's doing on earth. You know, I've got stories. I've got stories about all of you. We all have testimonies and many of us are simply awed by what is taking place among us. I am, as a pastor, as I look at what is happening among us, uh, and I'm talking about just the things that God is doing as he liberates the various gifts and the various talents and the resources and the spirits of our, of our church family. I just marvel at it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, have, I have no control over it. It is the it is the, the efflorescence, if you will, which means when spring is doing its thing, it's called efflorescence. It's when the flowers are at full bloom, when, when spring is at its zenith, that's, that's efflorescence. And that's what I am praying that God, and we have been praying that God would do, just cause our church to blossom with the various diverse gifts and personalities and talents and, and all the wonders that he's doing in each one of us. God, cause our church to be like springtime, just bursting forth with the love and the diversity and the, the uniqueness and the craziness and the wildness of all of the people of God as they are it, they are feeding on your love and sharing that love with one another. Develop us, Lord, so that we are a lush, a well-watered garden, as, your, as the scripture calls it. Just dripping with the dew of heaven and, 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 and feasting together upon that delicious fruit that we are imparting to one another. I've got stories. You've got stories, we've got testimonies, and many of us, as I said, are simply awed by what's taking place. And it's not a we thing. We're not doing it. It's a God thing. It's God doing it in us, God doing it through us. He deserves all the credit. He deserves all the glory. And we're all just caught up in it together. None of us can explain it. People try and they, they stumble over their words because it's a God thing. God is releasing the gifts in our church as I and us all of you were praying during that crisis. Lord, use this crisis to bring forth from each one of us the heavenly resources that you have planted in this body to enrich it. And let me tell you, if you're listening to me and you are in the family of God, you continue to pray this for yourself, for the brothers and sisters that are surrounding you, because God has placed a special treasure in you. And if you don't believe it, I dare you to find a verse in scripture that contradicts that. And I'm talking about you. You who think you're the lowliest of Christians, you out there who think you're marginal, you out there who thinks that nobody sees me, you who, you out there who thinks nobody appreciates me, or you're the one who thinks, I've got all kinds of problems, I'm stumbling and bumbling, and pastor, you don't know me, yeah, I don't know you, but God knows you, and he chose you, and he brought you into his family, and he has equipped you with special talents, gifts, resources, your defaults and your, I mean, your faults and defections, um, notwithstanding, he has, he has equipped you to be a part of the body and you are a member of the body of Christ just as validly as anybody else, including Pastor Dan, including the most prominent Christian on the planet and including the most prominent Christian who has ever lived, you are just as significant to God. The size and scope of your role does not determine your significance. It's the fact that God gave you that 
thing. That's what makes you significant, brother and sister. And I just pray that, and we did pray, Lord, continue to bless us with a deeper understanding of who you have made us to be and what you have given us to give. If it's money, if it's talent, if it's time, if it's prayer, if it's passion, if it's craziness, if it's humor, if it's that smile, if it's that warmth, if whatever it is, Lord, unleash it so that the body may glorify you. God is doing a great work. He's doing a great work in you. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Celebrate it. Don't look at all your faults. Don't get tripped up by the accuser of the brethren, which is who the evil one is. And he have you focused on all that you are not. Don't listen to him. Focus on all that you are. And focus on all that God is making you to be. You see, that's just a matter of your focus. You, you look at your blemishes all the time and that's what you're going to feel, blemished. You look at the glory of what God is doing in your life and that's what you're going to feel, glory, his glory. And you know what? Others are going to feel that glory too. That's why the evil one doesn't want you basking in it. Because when you begin to, it breaks forth and it blesses all those around us. So God is doing a great work in you, brother and sister. Don't you doubt it for a moment. Let your heart be glad for the work that God is doing in you to, to liberate the gifts and, and the effects and the resources that he's given you to build up the body. And he continues to do that. That was the third thing we prayed for. We continue to pray for that. God continues to make that a part of our culture. He continues to make knowing him a part of our culture. He and, and the appetite to know him better. He continues to make our love for one another the culture of our church so that we marvel, not only us, but people coming into our midst. They marvel and they say, what an amazing place. I feel the love of God. And I'm boasting about you behind your back all the time because I know that God is doing that through you. I know they're not just talking about Pastor Dan's love. I know they're not just talking about Brother Jim's love, although Brother Jim's very loving and Brother Teddy Bear has that nickname, Brother Teddy Bear, for a reason. He is loving. I'm not in any way diminishing his love. I'm just saying he's not the only one and he'd be the first to tell you that that love is flowing from above and flowing through him to you. And all of you, I have experienced great love among us because of what the Lord is doing as he continues to liberate our love and then as he continues to, to, to liberate our gifts. People are going to come. People are going to go. People are going to take with them irreplaceable qualities that will cause us to miss them forever. And then other people are going to come with different qualities that will cause us to feel as though they've been with us forever. And that is just the work of God's spirit. Pastor Dan's not going to be here forever. Tomorrow, I am 64. Do you know that? Tomorrow. And do you know, I remember writing in my journal, boy, time sure does fly. I'm 26. I remember. I have it. I have. <laughs> I keep referring to it at times. And I was feeling like, wow, I'm 26 years old now. Well, you know what? Here I am, 64 now. And I'm glad, as I wrote on Facebook the other day, that my wife says she, she promises she's still going to need me and she's still going to feed me when I'm 64, in keeping with the lyrics of the Beatles, when I'm 64. And I am thankful to her. I said, thank you, Lord. She's still going to need me. She's still going to feed me when I'm 64. But God has been gracious to me over those years. He's been gracious to all of us. And um, so let your heart be glad. And now I asked you to take a candle and to have a candle. I'm going to ask my wife to come in and um, I asked you to take a candle to light it because we're going to, at this time, join together in thanking God for these three things, for these blessings, for blessing us in faith, excuse me, for blessing us um, with these faith objectives blessing us with the fulfillment of them and blessing us by continuing to develop them 
So we're going to take some time. And usually what we would do on a Sunday is we would all, we'd turn the music on and we'd have everybody stand up and we would march around the sanctuary to the altar that we created with stones that have our names on them. And we would just walk past the altar and we'd touch them. And we, as a way of saying, yes, Lord, this is still our desire. We're re-signing up. We're thanking you and we're signing up again for um, these three things that you would continue to bless us with these. Because these are not just crisis insurance things. These are things that help us to be the best church we can be. These are things that help us to be our best selves individually. So why would we ever stop praying about them? And as I said, they're on the back of your bulletin every single Sunday. And uh, during our offertory, I encourage those who are praying for our offertory to pray for one or all three of those things when we're thanking the Lord for um, the opportunity to give. And so we are blessed by those things. And we're going to take some time now to thank the Lord for blessing us because he has blessed us. He has blessed us tremendously brothers and sisters valley brook he has blessed us brothers and sisters if your heart is resonating with these things whether you are a member of valley brook or not he has blessed you and we want to thank him for that this is thankful sunday and we are, and we want to thank him for that so that is why we light the candle as a way of saying thank you lord and as a way of saying, Lord, continue the marvelous work that you've been doing. Keep it going, Lord. We know it's not us. We know it's you. And we need you to keep it going. We need you, Lord, because you know what? It's not a financial crisis right now. Now it's a COVID crisis. <laughs> it's a race crisis in our country. Lord, we need you. We don't need you any less. We need you now. We need you, Lord, in these times to help us to know you better. Lord, through all the fog and the darkness and the fear and the disappointment and the hurt and the unrest, we need you, Lord. We need you to help us to know you better. We need you, Lord, to help us as your church to love one another more so that we can be a beacon in this dark world. We need you, Lord, to liberate our gifts because none of us can fix this, but all of us can be a part of what you're doing. None of us has the power to fix this trade that's running away. None of us. Lord, the blessing is that it feels like a runaway train to us, but the truth of the matter is you're the engineer and you know exactly where it's going. We may be flying from one side of the train to the other and bumping out of our seats and falling on the floor and losing our lunch, but Lord, you know where you're taking this thing. And so we thank you for that. And so that is why we have this celebration once a year, to remember that the Lord is blessing us with the knowledge of himself, to remember that he's blessed us with a deepening love for one another, and to remember that each one of us, each one of us is unique and special, valuable, that each one of us is essential and indispensable to the work that he's doing in our church and in our world. And that's what the strategic faith launch was about in 2014. Six years later, that's what it's about today in these times. And these things, brothers and sisters, as I said, will not only insulate our church, not only insulate the church universal, but your own individual life, your personal crises. The Lord wants to use your personal crises in the same way. So when you are in the midst of it, some deep it's, you look to the Lord and you say, Lord, use this to help me to know you better because that's the grand prize of life. Lord, use this to deepen my love for those around me, to bring out your love in me even more. And Lord, use this to show me how you want to use the resources that you have placed in me for this limited time only. I'm on this earth for just a limited time. Use this crisis, Lord, to liberate the effects of me, the, the effects that you've placed in me to make a difference in this situation, in the environment in which I am in. Because ultimately, you're the one who's in control of all of this. So we light the candle. I'm going to ask you right now to take, 
take the time and light your candle. And, 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 and if you would like to join us in thanking God for blessing us in, um, with these faith objectives, and uh, if you want to sign up with us to trust him, to continue to develop them in each of us and among us, light your candle and I'm going to give you a few moments, just a couple moments to silently commit these things to him on your behalf, on behalf of our church, on behalf of your family. So let's pause for a moment to, for all of us to let our hearts be glad by giving thanks to the Lord for all these areas and to ask him to continue to develop them in each of us and among all of us. Amen. If we were at the church, we would be marching around and and uh, to the song, What a Fellowship, and each one of us would be walking around either touching the altar stones or placing an altar stone on there if you're new to Valley Brook and you want to be a part of what the Lord is doing. We're going to take now some time now to remember the Lord with communion because the cross is an eternal marker. The cross is an everlasting monument of the Lord's unquenchable desire to be forever connected to us. Nothing demonstrates the love of God towards us greater than the cross of Christ. The scripture tells us God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This morning I was just thanking him for undergoing that agony. And the scripture says that he did it for the joy set before him. The joy set before Jesus wasn't anything that he was going to get from the Father when he got back to heaven. He had all of that before he left. <laughs> the joy set before him was us because that's what he did not have before he left heaven. We were separate from God. We were cut off. There was no other way but for Jesus himself to become the sacrifice for our sins. And so he considered us worth it to give his life in such an agonizing way that we would never be able to fathom because it wasn't just the physical punishment. It was the spiritual agony that he endured bearing our sins, the scripture says, and receiving punishment in his body for our sins, the punishment that we deserve, God inflicted upon him. And Jesus did that for the joy set before him, which is you and which is me, which is this sweet woman beside me. You are his joy. You are his. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's laughable. It's laughable. But you are. You are the joy that he saw in the future. Being able to be in relationship with you. Being able to have, have you have a heart that praises him. That was his joy. So the scripture tells us, For I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
We thank you, Lord, for this bread that was broken as a symbol of your body being broken for us. Thank you that you did it because, Lord, it was joy to you to consider being in relationship with us. We don't understand that, but Lord, you did. And so we take this bread with gratitude and we celebrate your love in Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, the scripture says he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we thank you for blessing us by having your body broken and your blood shed. Lord, we thank you that you felt every lash, you felt every spike driven into your body, you felt the scorn, you felt the crown of thorns being pressed into your scalp. Being God, you did not exempt yourself from suffering. You suffered fully for us. You poured out your body, your blood on our behalf as the spotless Lamb of God. And now, Lord, we've been sanctified by that blood. We stand in the presence of Almighty God sprinkled by that holy blood. And we thank you, Jesus, that the blood will never lose its power. That it is because of your blood that we stand in the presence of the living God, holy and blameless. And we thank you that we have been given the righteousness of God in Christ and having been sprinkled by your blood. So we take this cup together now with thankfulness in our hearts for what it represents in our relationship with you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. amen. God bless you. I'd like to say a benediction after which, again, um, stop your stream or it may come on automatically, whatever you do normally. Stop it and restart it if it doesn't start right away. And uh, you'll be treated to a um, special selection uh, from Rasan and uh, his mom, Anika. And after that, uh, Bobby and Dina will have their announcement and, uh, and we will be done for the day. Thank you for choosing to join us on this special celebratory Sunday. It's been an honor to share with you. It's been an honor to be with you. And I am sure the Lord is honored that we set our hearts on him and on giving him thanks for the wonders he's done among us. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.